Hey everyone, welcome from sunny southern Sweden. It's pretty warm today, not as hot as it is in uh, my hometown, but you know, nice. So, figured, continue these little chats, ideas that you guys gave me from a previous video. So this is from Anachronous Joe. He wanted to talk about like the different groups that worship the old gods. And, uh, of course we know there is some correlation uh, amongst many Proto-Indo-European pantheons. Uh, you know, the Greeks and Romans basically had the same pantheon, which is different from the Norse. But the Norse is what we remember because it was the last successional stage of Germanic paganism. However, it came from the same root that uh, the Continental Germans came from. And we know... The continental Germans, such as the Franks and Chersuka, all worshipped it, and the Angles and the Saxons and the Utes. But if you think about it, the Angles and the, and the Utes are actually Scandinavian, and the Danewerk, uh, the little, I shouldn't say little, the giant fortification across all of Jutland uh, that protects Charlemagne from Charlemagne during the Saxon Wars was actually in modern day Germany, and Saxons were on the other side. And then you have the Visigoths and Ostrogoths that came down from Scandinavia with their roots and the Langobards, uh, which literally went to Lombardy. Um, so they all followed different variations of Germanic paganism. Um, you know, we all know about Radbad. I mean, basically, all of northern, central to northern France, uh, the Alpine region north to Scandinavia had some sort of variation or intermix with Germanic deities, maybe some Celtic. And if we look at the, uh, the deities of the Baltic region and some of the Slavic deities, Slavic start to go off on their own family, um, you know, a concept such as duality, which is super cool. And maybe there's some correlation there in ancient times with Nordic mythology or influence, but we can't, we can only speculate about that. There are some interesting comparisons. The Baltic is very close with uh, Pedan and their thunder god and the fact that he had an axe. Really similar, shows some admixture and interrelation. Uh, what I wanted to say here was, you know, it's really in vogue to be like anti or, or super PC. I, you know, a lot of people here in Scandinavia are super PC and like uh, really, they have a shock value when people are into Vikings in some way or Viking mythology, Nordic mythology, because they think it was tied to a lot of Nazism before. So I met this girl out one time, right? And she asked me about my hammer. I tried to explain to her, like I have to explain to some of these type of Swedes that no, Swedes are not the only people that worshiped uh, Northern gods. As a Prussian, my family did too. And um, you know, the Germans did as well because she was questioning me on why I had a hammer on as if like, it's funny because she's anti purity and anti all that but yes yeah, she's questioning me like why would I have this on why should I wear it I'm not even from here so anyway with that being said she said one of her cousins was super proud of being a viking and all and she was like oh yeah we, you know our grandfather's from Belgium so you're not even pure and like went after her and I said excuse me do you know nothing about your own heritage people in Belgium had the same Belgium had the same gods before Christian times this is not some kind of small regional thing. This is all of Northern Europe experienced the same history, the same advance and recession of the ice sheets, the same hardness of life as you had to change to the successional environ zones. When ice sheets came down, they were precipitated by forest die off. And then the ice sheets came and maybe they didn't come all the way to where your family was from, but it would have been permafrost and tundra. And then people followed back up the coast as the ice sheets receded to eat seal and to um, eat other marine mammals. And then they would follow herds of caribou, and oh, I'm sorry, not caribou, they're in North America, herds of reindeer and mammoth and other of the steep animals that would follow up in the tundra. And then the forest would grow back. So the people would move. It was there wasn't this uh, giant, I know we talk about the Hycian forest, I might have mispronounced that, the giant forest that went from France to the Dnieper, right? All across Europe, and it was the northern border of the ancient Roman Republic. And it 
it stretched all through Europe. Yeah, that's fine. But we weren't living there for 10,000 years in these virgin forests. These forests were only a few hundred years old because as the environments changed, it pushed the people around and people had to adapt. So we got to get rid of that. Like the sacred groves. Yes, we did worship in the sacred groves, but that's maybe because there was no trees. So the first place the trees sprouted up, oh man, that's where we should worship because life bringing forces of energy and warmth and everything are coming back. So that's something interesting that a lot of the guys around the turn of the 20th century were writing about historically to try to strip away all the Christianized, Christianized elements. Um, I keep referring back to this book, but you know, it's very interesting to see how like, the Franks claimed they were descended from the lost tribe of Israel, and the, the Romans claimed they were descended from the Trojans, and Basically, everybody had to claim they were descended from something else to give them legitimacy, to give them the power and the right to rule and the mandate from heaven or the mandate from God. So, if you strip that away, well, why do we worship in sacred groves? Because at some point in our cultural memory, it was tundra, it was steep, there was no forest. So when the forest came out, hey, this, is a, this must be a blessed area. That's why also wells, I mean... We, we know up into the modern period that Forseti, for example, was uh, worshipped in a well. And I think about it, Yigdrasil and Mimir's well. I mean, these things are important for a reason. They must have held some type of importance historically to our ancestors. And if nothing else, trees give you shelter from the elements. And, and they insulate the area that you are living in. They give you a little bit of protection, a little bit of cover. And guess what? Once there's enough of them, you can cut them down, manipulate them, and make yourself houses and have way more cover, way more protection. You can put up palisades with them. And, and you know, so there, it's, it's not strange that these things became sacred to us and sacred to the entire northern European realm. So I don't, I don't think anybody should think of uh, Norse paganism as something specifically Scandinavian. It is in that expression, but... There are other paganisms that were interrelated, and they adapted as they separated. Of course, Anglo-Saxon paganism had to adapt to the realities of insular life. They lived on an island. And, of course, the Alcida, the Saxon, had to adapt to living in the more forested areas of Germany. I mean, like I said before, it's easy to see. If you read these sagas of the Icelanders, the tales of Iceland and the tales of, say, Sweden or Estland and further east are much different. And we talked about this with the pre prevalence of hammers and axe symbols. But yeah, I mean, that's just amusing on what anachronist, anachronist Joe asked me, um, you know, about the different groups that worship the old gods. And basically, if you look at a Roman map, there's Celtic names and Germanic names, and pretty much all the Germanic names would have worshipped a similar, although changed pantheon like we said before they adapted different areas had different sacred gods in those specific places um you know and we also have to acknowledge and realize that germanic paganism really only maybe solidified when germanic culture got a border it was an admixture of different types of tribes celtic tribes maybe even some slavic tribes that had moved further west earlier on but in ad 9 when Adamineus, Herman the German, defeated the Roman legions and created a boundary at the Rhine River, it gave a area for people to commingle and develop other than outside that border. And what happened is these people commingled and developed into what we know now as the Germanic tribes. Could have been several different ethnic rootstocks, but they commingled, they became one, and that's kind of where the formation or the origination of Germanic paganism is. All these different people there, interrelated, they came up with something that was to them. And as time spread out, Proto-German became Proto-Norse, and, and everything kind of developed into the areas it went to. But, you know, don't forget all the major players. The Bavarians, the Chersukas, the uh, Churi, the, the Hangles, the Saxons, the Utes, the Svea, the... 
Ustigoths, the Visigoths, the Franks, the everybody, the Frisians. They all worship variations of the same pantheon. So I know this is a little bit of a ramble, and I hope it's good for you. Um, I gotta go to work here in a little bit. Um, and I'm gonna try a new job out tomorrow. So that's cool. But for now, enjoy your own Nordic journeys, my friends. <laughs>